So thanks, Urjit, and thanks, Siram, for the invitation. And my talk, I've changed the title a little because I'm going to be speaking about cosmological observables, but with particular focus on the nature of dark matter. So there are a host of cosmological observables. But this will focus my talk. So apart from the usual cosmological observables, I will pick the ones which say something about the nature of dark matter during my talk. So I'll start my talk with a view graph on what the dark matter is. This is very unusual from the point of view of this meeting, for instance, there's been, there's been a lot of conceptual discussion and this is going to be astronomy. So dark matter came into astronomy first before it came into cosmology around the same time actually. And uh, one of the best evidence we have is from the rotation curve of spiral galaxies. And when we look at the rotation of stars and gas in spiral arms, uh, we notice that most of the mass is in the center while, and this should have suggested if most of the mass was actually in the center, the rotational velocity should have fallen as one over r far away from the center. But it's actually constant far away from the center, which implies that there is matter in galactic halo that doesn't shine through star formation. And uh, we can actually estimate the mass of the Milky Way to be around 10 power 12 solar masses, which is nearly 10 times the total mass in gas and stars. And that is up to 50 kiloparsec. And I'll come back to this point, what I mean when I say mass up to 50 kiloparsec. And for other spiral and elliptical galaxies, it's more or less the same number, but you cannot fix the number by these observations alone. Also from clusters of galaxies, uh, I mean, and this was started even before galaxies. There's an orbits of galaxies, there's intracluster medium and its temperature, and there is gravitational lensing. And way back in 1930s, we can notice that galaxies are moving far too fast in clusters, then their own potentials can actually create. This kind of velocities cannot be created by their own potential, so there ought to be something else there. And again, coma cluster is a very good example, and the ratio of the baryonic mass to dark matter is around 10 up to 3 megaparsec. So you see the scale here is also important. So one thing that one can conclude from this is that when you are looking at an astronomic as an object in the sky, a galaxy or a cluster of galaxy, you need a tracer to go further away from the center. You need a baryonic tracer actually. So you can't really say what the total mass is. It depends on what the scale is. So whenever an astronomer talks about this much dark matter, one always says, okay, up to this far from the center. So that is why in Milky Way, the typical number is 50 kiloparsec and for coma cluster, the typical number is three megaparsecs. There is, till date, there is only one evidence, direct evidence of dark matter. And this is also not really direct, but more or less direct. And this is based on what is called a bullet cluster, where two clusters are colliding each other. And you see there are two kinds of shades here. One is bluish and the one is reddish. So two clusters have gone past here in this view graph and the bluish is where the dark matter is and reddish is where the baryonic matter is so when they go past each other baryonic matter will collide with each other and will not separate so easily while the dark matter will is much will will separate much more easily so there is a clear separation here we actually see in this particular case and the only case so far that we are able to see that there ought to be matter which interacts much less than baryons in the objects that we see around ourselves Now the question of what this dark matter could be, and this is also a very important question in cosmology, we take for granted that dark matter is some kind of a field or particle, but a lot of focus on dark matter research until this day has been on all kinds of other things. It could be a planet. I mean, pl planet doesn't shine, so it will be, be like dark matter or cold white dwarfs. So when stars end their lives, most of them become white dwarfs, like sun will become white dwarf, and then they fade away and they would be undetectable. But this has been done and uh, there are multiple projects of microlensing and I'll not go into details of that and Macho project is just one of them, which uh, determined that the mass of such objects is less than 10 to 11 solar masses, but it depends on the mass range between 0 0.2 to 0 0.9 solar masses. So it's possible that some of these objects are out there in the galaxy and we call them dark matter, but they cannot give you 10 to 12 solar masses. That much is also clear. Besides, we cannot cope. This is in the halo, so we have some evidence that uh, there ought to be something else out there. You can have exotic objects from early universe, primordial black holes, and we'll have talks on that. So I'll not say much more. 
but this is also constrained by micro lensing if you add these objects and light from a distant quasar something will get micro lensed and recent subaru result put some uh, bounds on it so it is possible that a fraction of dark matter is in these of exotic objects and now we come to what i'm going to be discussing most of the rest of my talk elementary particles dark matter could be elementary particles and way back i mean this was like late 1970s when gun and trimen put a bound on how much of this dark matter could be out there in our galaxy and if it is fermionic then and we have a galaxy has a potential well so we can actually it should be deep enough to counter fermi pressure and fermi pressure will depend on the mass of the particle so it gives you an upper mass low bound on the mass of the dark matter particle and uh, this uh, line of thinking has continued and for dwarf spheroidal for instance and i'm quoting a bound which is from some 3 years ago that gives mass of dark matter particle if it is fermionic ought to be more than 0.5 0.4 kilo electron volt so these numbers have to be kept in mind i'll keep coming back to these numbers okay dark matter in cosmology how does it come into cosmology cosmology uh, we know by now that most of the things that really dominate are dark i mean there is dark matter and there is dark energy and uh, so in some ways some of these dark components determine the equation of state of the background cosmology itself they are in the background right so for instance this plays some role in determining the neutrino degrees of freedom from cmb data and part of the degree of freedom could actually be coming from massive neutrino which is dark matter but what i'm going to be focusing on for most of the rest of my talk is clustering in linear perturbation theory and this is really important in the universe so we were we have had talks about inflation but for most cosmologist the action starts much later on initial hypersurface where all the modes are outside the horizon and then for a multiple component fluid it is evolved all the way to the present so this generalizes the genes analysis to multiple component interacting fluids and here is where you can see what the nature of dark matter might mean it might mean its initial velocity dispersion and i will show you figures to show how it actually has an impact on what we observe its interaction with other matter it's a neutrinos baryons etc and its interaction with itself dark matter can it interact with itself without interacting with anything else if it has zero initial velocity dispersion that implies cold dark matter that's a definition of cold dark matter when you say something is cold it means completely cold it means its initial velocity dispersion is zero so dark matter entered cosmology actually to solve a problem of cosmology and uh, it was realized way back in late 1960s and 70s that uh, if you look at the dynamics of this coupled these baryons and photon fluid then silk damping wipes out or perturbations all the way to around 10 megaparsec i mean even more it depends on what the baryonic density is but that 10 megaparsec roughly corresponds to a large cluster today which means that up to a large cluster scale everything has been wiped out the perturbations have been wiped out just after recombination so how do we reseed those perturbations so people speculated initially that maybe big structures form first which is what also happens in something called hot dark matter and then they fragment or uh, it is possible that you have cold dark matter and if you have cold dark matter a scenario that has survived until this day then these will seed perturbations in baryons in the post recombination era and i'll show you some figures regarding that so it is important so dark matter is needed in cosmology to seed perturbations that have been wiped out during recombination it's a very important role so like i said there were two kinds of dark matter which were particles which were discussed one was hot dark matter and one is cdm and we'll see later that we have a bit of both actually in our universe so there was this debate that went on and on for all of 70s and 80s and host of papers were written but it was improved detection of galaxy clustering uh, in late 1980s that shed some light on this issue so this was the first large survey which was an apm automated plate measurement survey which gave the first measurement of the power spectrum in fact the two point correlation function at scales 
which could say something about whether the dark matter was cold or hot. And this is a well-known paper in 1989, which basically showed, well, it should, it's most likely cold. Most of the dark matter ought to be cold. It cannot be very hot. So then cold dark matter won the debate and so on. But then of course it kept improving through 1990s and clustering signal at large scales like R greater than 10 megaparsec. But again, I'll use this interchangeably. I'll say R 10 megaparsec and K just inverse of that. I mean, it's, I could put a pi there, but you get the general picture. So clustering signal, it went from like around 10 megaparsec and now we can actually estimate it to a few hundred megaparsecs. So, but the point is that if you want to compare theory with observation, one has to go into linear scale. And this is this sets the linear scale in the, pre, in the present universe. R ought to be more than 10 megaparsec or K has to be less than 0.1 megaparsec inverse. That's when we can compare our theory with observation. Otherwise, there's a fair amount of modeling that is needed and doesn't always give you the best results. This became available again from 1980s APM, last campaigners. And of course, the champions of today are, 2DF actually was the first champion. I mean, it came in, late 1990s and was the first very large scale survey. And then of course the SDS as which continues until this day. And then of course the nature of dark matter was determined far, far more precisely by the CMB data, which is post WMAP 2003 roughly. So here is a plot which actually gives you a sense of what we are trying to do. This is density perturbations at actually 1000 and I'll spend a bit more time with this particular plot. So what I have done here is that we have taken the multiple component fluid in the early universe and evolved it. If you look at the left hand side of this figure, so K less than, so K is the abscissa. If you look at the left hand side of the figure, that all the components, the CBM, the baryons, the massive neutrinos and photons, they all behave the same way. So outside the horizon, so at redshift of thousand, they have not yet entered the horizon. So all components, everything behaves the same way outside the horizon, more or less. Apart from, so everything is an ideal fluid outside the horizon. Even neutrinos are ideal fluid outside the horizon. And uh, I have put them all equal to the same value. The, there is a slight difference that comes from the fact that some of it is fermionic and some of it is not. But it doesn't make any difference. There's a very slight difference. I have put it exactly equal. One. So this is called the transfer function. I have put everything equal to one at very large scales. And this is a snapshot of density perturbation at redshift 1000. If you notice all components, once they enter the horizon, behave differently, right? There is a CDM which has large perturbations, actually. You can actually see it has large perturbations. And then there is baryons and photons. They oscillate together. You can see they are oscillating together, more or less. And there are massive neutrinos. I have not plotted massless neutrinos because I put very small mass to massive neutrinos here. So massless neutrino more or less lie on top of this, so I have not plotted it. So you notice it gives you two very important pieces of information, which I'm going to use later on. One is that suppose it was not cold dark matter, but hot dark matter. The plot of the dark matter would be somewhere between the green curve of a massive neutrino and the blue curve of CDM. That's where it will behave actually. So it'll be somewhat lower. Perturbations would be far lower than what you actually measure. So, because, and I'll show you later, the blue curve is what we actually roughly see in galaxy surveys and also is supported by CMB observation. Uh, we cannot put a lot of velocity dispersion to the cold dark matter, what we call the dark matter. And second, very important piece of information from this is if dark matter really interacted with the rest of the matter and what could it really interact with? It could interact with baryons. Then again, this blue curve will slope downwards it will approach the curve for baryons and photons and somewhere in the middle, that's where it will lie and might oscillate. Yet again, from observations, we have not much evidence of that. I mean, we have some evidence of baryonic perturbations being impinged on dark matter. I'll come to that. But uh, we know for sure now that one component of dark matter ought to be really very cold. How cold? I'll come to. So these are two pieces Piece of important piece of information. Dark matter, one dominant component of it is likely very cold and it doesn't interact very strongly, at least at redshift of 1000 or a little before that with baryons. So here are the scales in the problem and always very important to keep these scales in the problem. One scale is the matter radiation equality epoch 
and that determines the shape of CDM perturbation. You notice the CDM perturbation slope down. So when CDM perturbation enter the horizon, they do not grow. So this single scale determines the shape of the CDM perturbation. The mode that enters the horizon at maturation quality. Sound velocity of the baryon photon fluid and you saw things oscillating, baryons and photons oscillating together. And this is determined by the sound velocity of the coupled fluid. And this sound velocity is pretty large actually, it's close to C. In fact, the largest you can have is C by square root of three and that's what I put here. That's the largest velocity a baryon photon fluid can have. Generally it will have smaller because baryons are not zero, but they're close to that actually in, in, the, universe, in the context of the universe. There are far too many photons compared to baryons. At ratio of 1000, it sets another scale in the problem. And you notice a much larger scale. So this scale actually tells you this oscillation, the CMB, we have seen those patterns of CMB oscillations, and they are all multiples of this particular scale. So this is the larger scale, and then we have multiples of this, smaller and smaller scales. The third very, very important scale is silk damping. And the silk damping scale comes because the baryon photon fluid is not ideal. <laughs> there is a radiative viscosity which tend to kill perturbations in that fluid. And typically, the scale is determined by the geometric ratio of the H inverse, the age of the universe, the length scale of the universe at that time, and the mean free path of the photon. And again, this scale, if you notice, is much smaller. It has to be smaller than the K sum. But uh, what is very important about this scale is that perturbations de depend uh, exponentially on this scale. And so it's a very, very important scale. And the fourth scale here, because I'm talking about dark matter, is the scale which is given by the massive neutrinos. So if you have massive neutrino, they will wipe out perturbations before they become non-relativistic. In fact, they keep wiping out perturbations even later on. So typical scales, like for instance, if I have a mass of neutrinos around 0.2 electron volt, then it will wipe out perturbations almost 200 megaparsec. Right, at least in that component. Here is a plot. So what I have done is I have taken that plot, which I had shown you earlier, and I have extended it all the way to a of thousand. Now it looks much, much simpler. And you can see what really has happened. And I'll spend a bit of time on it. What happened to photon perturbations? Photon free streamed and went away. Right. Baryonic perturbations fell into the potential well created by CDM. I told you this is exactly the reason we wanted dark matter in the first place. Because otherwise, baryonic perturbations, if you notice in the previous plot, they were far smaller. Right? So they needed potential wells to fall into them. But because baryons are only a sixth of the dark matter now, because we, we know that our universe is dominated by dark energy, there are, you can see, typical oscillation patterns on the plot at the top. Baryons and cedium, they move together now in linear perturbation theory. But there are some oscillations that you actually see, which come from the baryonic part of the perturbation. And these have been detected, right? They're called baryon acoustic peaks. The third thing that I have plotted is a massive neutrino. Again, I have taken a massive neutrino around 2.2 electron volt, and there is a reason for that. And they have not yet fallen into all the potential. Well, they're still falling, actually. So these perturbations are still changing. They're growing over a period of time. But this is a snapshot of ratio of zero. And, uh, all the relativistic components have gone away. They have massive massless neutrinos do not play any role. They have wiped out those perturbations. Photons do not play any role. So here is one, the first important result which give you a sense of what we observe. This is SDS's data of galaxy clustering. And this, I just picked it from a paper in 2013. There are many, many such papers and there are many such plots. I'll just pick one of those plots. I like this one. And uh, this plots the power spectrum of the matter against K. And K is right here. If, if you notice, and this is like one thing I want to point out. So if you, uh, so this is a theoretical curve. The line is a theoretical curve, actually. So you see, it matches quite well with theory. I'll not go into what the quadrupole is. I can take questions on it later on. But monopole is what we are after and it fits data. Theory fits, data fits theory very well. But one thing you notice, look at the y-axis. Y-axis is plotted only to k equal to 0.2. I noted early in my talk that k equal to 0.1 roughly fixes the scale at which the theory is linear until now. And that is where the prediction of linear theory can be compared. So in fact, you can cut it in half and go to a 0.1. 
and this is where the data becomes reliable if you can reliably compare it with theoretical prediction after point 1 uh, it's harder to compare i mean you can say you can go to point 5 they have plotted it all the way to point 2 but this tells you that all the data up to now can actually give you reasonable predictions up to around point 1 or point 2 but no larger than that k not larger than that or not on scales smaller than that very interestingly the planck results and i'm showing you what the planck results are for the first time planck actually is able to probe the perturbations to the same value of k roughly which galaxy surveys do which is around k of 0.1 this is not true of w map for instance because planck goes all the way to around 2500 so l can be converted to a rough k and uh, this is there in planck paper so i'm not going to refer to that paper but many planck papers actually try to construct the power spectrum and show that up to around k of 0.15 we can reconstruct the power spectrum and which is very important because galaxy surveys are not going to give you uh, such reliable information because of non linearity setting in this is all at h of 0 the planck results give you very powerful information that yes indeed there was something like a cold dark matter dominated universe if you look at planck results and i have summarized it very briefly here so it tells you something about primordial perturbation and i think this was boon for single field inflationary model the value of ns because single field inflationary model all predicted ns is close to 1 but smaller than 1 and there is five sigma evidence of that from this measurement again the baryons omega b h square you can see i mean uh, agrees very well with uh, for instance nucleosynthesis data third one is important for us that's a non relativistic component of the dark matter and uh, again you can see that it's measured reasonably precisely h that's another story and i'll not go into it this is the most precise measurement of hubble's constant but there is an ongoing debate because it doesn't really agree with other data from low red shifts again massive neutrinos so we know from particle physics data that there ought to be massive neutrinos in the universe because particle physics data tells you the difference between neutrino masses and they are measured so either omega nu is less greater than 0 0.001 that's called the normal hierarchy or it's twice the value which is called the inverted hierarchy so particle physics data definitely tells you th there are neutrinos out there there is another component of dark matter apart from cold dark matter there are massive neutrinos the current bound it's very interesting and current bound again from planck takes you around a fifth five times that value so the current bound tells you omega nu is less than 0 0.005 we need to get to at least 0 0.002 to make comparison with particle physics not clear it is possible talk to many people and i'll not spend so much time on it in fact i'll not spend any time on this issue for the rest of my talk whether one can actually get down to 0 0.002 or not but there are planned experiments cmb experiments in particular and laman alpha data and i might say a few words on that later during my talk may throw some light on this massless neutrinos they have been detected like again it's not easy to detect it it comes from matter radiation equality again how much how many massless neutrinos there are the effective number of degrees of freedom are around 3 and they measure reasonably well and total matter content and this is something we have discussed like inflation has been discussed this is one of the predictions of inflation that the universe ought to be nearly flat spatially flat and we know the omega total is around 1 and it's consistent with the spatially flat universe you can actually if you change the value of h you can change omega too but uh, i'll not go into that so this was the good part of the story uh, so cosmological data has told us a lot about dark matter and we seem to believe that this dark matter is a particle a particle which has come from supersymmetry theory called lightest supersymmetry particle that's what everybody thought dark matter was but people have been searching for it now for the last 15 years or so and if you look at this plot one thing the most notable part of this plot for me is that uh, sensitivity has improved by two orders of magnitude even more actually from starting point of uh, even in last 10 years it has improved by last two, two by two or three orders of magnitude and people have gone to cross sections which are well below the cross section of the weak interaction i mean 10 power minus 46 around eight orders of magnitude is smaller than weak interaction and they haven't found anything so these are upper bounds 
from data from 2017 or 18, there may be more plots like this, but it's an ongoing project. <clears throat> so we, people have searched in deep minds, this particular particle, the lightest supersymmetric particle, which will interact with the rest of the, the matter with an interaction cross-section, which is well below weak interaction cross-section. And it has not yet been found. And some of these things you can see the darkened regions. These are the allowed regions. So you'll always have allowed region now. Okay. So a typical allowed region people are looking for now is one TeV particle, right? But which interacts with the rest of the matter with an interaction cross section of 10 power minus 45. That's a hope. But we haven't yet found it. So this is one part of the story that hasn't gelled well as far as the dark matter is concerned. Cosmological data has constrained it extremely well to a certain scale, but not below that. But we haven't yet found this dark matter. The second part of disagreement happens at subgalactic scales. And this is another thing that has gone on for the last 20 years. You look at the references, they go back on 20 years. So there are three things which are generally discussed. People looked at through simulation subhalos of Milky Way and found. They were 25 times more in simulation than we actually observed. And uh, it would seem to suggest that there would probably be less power at small scales then. Uh, cold dark matter part, cold dark matter power spectrum cannot be extended below 0.1 or 0.2. It probably loses power below that. A second piece of information is that they expected the profiles at the center for a completely cold dark matter to be cuspy. Yet observations suggest they are flat profiles and maybe it is caused by interacting dark matter or something else, again suggesting that the power is cut at small scales. And third piece of evidence actually is 2011, so it's not that long back, where people tried to address the first point, whether you can have in Milky Way very small structures. If the structures are very small, then we can hide them and maybe they are not seen. So 25 times discrepancy can be dealt with. But they showed that structures are actually too large and it would not have been it would have been very difficult to hide them. They would have hosted binary structures. They should have been seen, but we don't see them. So this is called too big, big to fail conundrum. So these three are probably suggesting that the dark matter, uh, the cold dark matter scenario is not complete. It is complete up to a certain scale, but below that scale, there is something else that is playing a role. And typically all of these observations tend to suggest that there is less power at small scales than CDM gives. So now I'll come to one very important and very interesting observation from another area of research, uh, which is from 2018. And uh, this is to do with, and I'll not go into detail of the physics of this. It was a deep absorption trough, which was found in a frequency range in radio frequency. Uh, at 500 millikelvin. And so these numbers, you will not be able to appreciate what it would mean. I'll come to it briefly. And uh, if people actually interpreted it as H1 absorption, the H1 is a neutral hydrogen. It has a hyperfine line at 21 centimeter. And it is absorption owing to this line. And at 70 to 90 megahertz, this absorption must have happened in the rest frame in the redshift range of 15 to 19 in a nearly neutral medium. If this is the case, and this like made waves, this particular observation. And because it's an absorption trough, if you look at the brightness temperature difference of the H1 with C and B, you can see that the, the radiation temperature was higher than the matter temperature. Radiation temperature is TR in this view graph and TK is the matter temperature. If radiation temperature exceeded TK, then delta TB would be positive or it would be negative. So clearly matter is cooler than radiation. That much is clear because you're seeing an absorption trough. But how much cooler was the question? And as soon as people started looking at the physics, they found there is something odd about this observation. The matter temperature in the post recombination universe is determined by the residual ionization fraction actually. And that physics is extremely well known to us because we know recombination extremely well. CMB observations are sent very, very sensitive to recombination physics. So if you believe in what happened at redshift of 1000 and use the same equation and extend it all the way to redshift of 20, we found that even in the most ideal case, this stuff should not have been deeper than 180 millikelvin, but it was minus 500. So either the radiation temperature is higher by a factor of 2.5 and what other radiation can actually exist at redshift of 20 apart from CMB. But temperature of matter is smaller by the same factor minimum. 
You can do with more, but this is minimum. So this observations, of course, can be interpreted roughly. Again, there are no good interpretation of it in one today in some way. Uh, you can have a higher radio background at ratio of 20 is possible. Or it could be just a misinterpretation of the data. It could be an interstellar, interstellar absorption in our galaxy from rotating dust. So many of these proposals were made, but then accompanying paper made the proposal that this is because of additional dark matter baryon coupling. And uh, it did, what additional matter do, uh, dark matter baryon coupling does, and I have put the equations here, is if the thermal bath of the dark matter, so not dark matter is assumed to be interacting with matter. Look, this is, I already showed you before that this is something which is not easy to pull through given the CMB data, CMB data and the matter power spectrum data constrains it very strongly, this kind of a coupling. So if you're going to have a coupling like this, it must be such that this coupling is small at ratio to 1000. Because at ratio to 1000, we know the physics, it's very well constrained by very good data. But it is large only around ratio to 20, where this data is. Uh, the best such coupling is Coulomb scattering. Coulomb scattering is proportional to 1 by V4. And V actually decreases. V is the relative velocity between two particles. The universe is cooling. So the relative velocity is decreasing. So this cross section is increasing. And this was proposed actually by an accompanying paper that dark matter is merely charged. It has a small charge. You see, it can't be fully charged also. If it was fully charged, there'll be problems, as I already showed. So it is milli charged. It has a small charge, one part in 10 per six or something. And there are theories of this kind. And it is Coulomb scattering of this particle with the residual fraction and its fraction, which is resulting in, in coupling the dark matter and baryons. And this coupling becomes stronger around ratio to 20. And very simple model, really. But dark matter, so you have a dark matter bath whose temperature is unknown, but it is actually interacting with the rest of the matter. But the thermal bath is actually at a lower temperature, the dark matter than baryons, so baryons can actually cool in it. So this is a model that was studied in great detail. There are quite a few papers on this, which people studied like they tried to, and I will show you some plots later in my talk. It is also possible and something I recently worked on that you can try to explain it by energy injection in a pre-recombination era could come up from decay of a dark particle. And I'll briefly discuss it. So what are the alternative dark matter models people have discussed in the literature? In fact, there are quite a few models. I've just looked at a, I have like listed just a subset of them here. You could, dark matter may not be cold, it could be warm. It's a massive particle which has a mass like KeV. So it does free stream and suppresses density perturbations at cosmological scales. You can have Ultra light axion. This is one dark matter which is actually very popular these days because this is motivated partly by uh, string theory that you can have ultra light axion particle. This is like scalar field in its ground state. It has a mass like 10 power minus 22 electron volt, very, very small mass, but well, its velocity is close to zero. So it has a coherent scale of the universe and uh, it has a sound velocity which is changes its scale. So density perturbations again in this case also are. But, are suppressed at small scales, something that we need. I recently worked on one part, one class of models where we can have a stable dark matter particle in electromagnetic interaction. And here again, you can form an atom of dark matter with proton or helium atom and or between two charged dark matter particle and study their observable cosmological consequences. And again, class of these models can give you lower power at small scales. Here I'm going to show you some, a few cases of how it is done. Please do not worry about how, what models I have plotted it because not explained some of these models. In most of these models, what we seek is that observations agree with data all the way to around K equal to 0.2, 0.3. I said like 0.2, 0.3 should suffice for us to agree with Planck and the other kind of data sets, at least the best cosmological data, which is Planck data and galaxy clustering data. It agrees with it. But at lower scales, it does all kinds of things. In some cases, in fact, it could be more power also. But in majority of these cases, the power is suppressed at small scales. Here is another, the millicharge particle. I referred to millicharge particle when I was saying, we we're talking about edges detection. So again, millicharge particle can also suppress power. And it does actually, you can see that it suppresses power. And all the models which I've shown here are ruled out more or less, except for a few. Because again, when you look at these scales, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, I mean here, CMB data really constrains the power spectrum 
extremely well. So most of these models are ruled out actually. Here is, I've shown you a CMB power spectrum for one of the models, like uh, it's a model like that, that I constructed, which is like two dark matter particles, both charged and they form an atom. And in this case, you can see that uh, this is CMB power spectrum and it decreases power at small scales. And again, some of these models are also can be ruled out given the kind of CMB data we really have. Here is actually a detailed comparison of Planck data with this charged dark matter particle. And you can see these are what are called posterior probabilities, of these parameters. And uh, the defining curve is, this is CDM and this is the CCDM. So you can put around 1% for this particular mass that was picked here for these particles in the charged CDM particles. So one can ana analyze, like compare in detail with CMB data. So this was whatever I've told you so far are some of the models which tend to disturb CMB in the sense like to get to CMB, like charged CDM particle, because it couples strongly later, it affects large scale. And so it makes much more sense to compare with the best data that is available to you, which is the CMB data. On the other hand, there are a host of cosmological observables at small scales. And these are the ones which are going to promin become prominent in the years to come. Because these are the models which directly constrain the dark matter models at small scale. So CMB data is not going to play an important role because CMB data can play a role up to 0.1, 0.2. And it's not going to improve, by the way, because even if you go to smaller, larger values of LN, there are enough observations of that using interferometers, ground-based inter interferometers. But they mostly tend to probe what I call secondary anisotropies, not primary anisotropies. So for getting primary anisotropies, sorry, inhomogeneity is at really small scales. One needs to go to other set of observables. And here is a set of observables. The Lyman alpha clustering is the most important in more ways than one, but it's a fairly important, uh, very difficult modeling actually. But it can actually probe nonlinear density perturbations at scales up to k equal to four megaparsec inverse. So you see now we have gone to a scale. You see this is scale is around 40 times smaller than the CMB can probe. Very important. Epoch of reionization, now there is a huge amount of research that's going on in trying to detect it and also theoretical modeling of what happens around epoch of reionization. And the idea is to try to get neutral hydrogen and the evolution of it from this period. This probe scales of between five to 25, so it's even smaller scales it can actually probe. One of the observable that we actually came up with, collapsed fraction of matter at high redshift. So this again comes from H1 data and can probe scales up to five megaparsec inverse and can rule out some models fairly easily. My own favorite and should be everybody's favorite is CMB spectral distortion from silk damping. This is an entirely linear probe, very, very powerful linear probe. So basically, if you cut out power at small scales or you do something like that, you change the dynamics of silk damping from a period from between 10 power six to 10 power three. And this can actually give you a probe of scale all the way to 10 power 4 megaparsec inverse, extremely tiny scales in a completely linear probe. And it's a completely linear probe. It's early universe after all, right? There is no uncertainty in physics. All the three that I talked about, wow, they are, this physics is fairly uncertain. This physics is extremely clean. So these are kind of probes which are going to be discussed. And I'll show you some view graphs of how well observations compare with data. So here is a plot which is based on ultra light axion model and it compares the prediction of the model with existing data and this existing data of what collapse fraction is. So your model has to be higher than that because it can collapse in different forms, not just in neutral hydrogen, but you can actually see there is a model which is ruled out. So if the ultra light axion mass is 10 to the power minus three electron volt, it actually, this data rules it out. So it data of even now has predictive power, even though it is set to improve in the future. Here is H1 signal from the epoch of reionization for the same model. And you can see the Lambda CDM model. So this is a slice of a simulation that we did. If you take a Lambda CDM model, the difference between these two is that the, uh, so these are, uh, these are ionized regions. The dark blue regions are ionized regions. So here you can see the ionized region. These are dark blue regions. So the dark blue regions are larger. The topology of the reionization changes when you go from Lambda CDM model to a dark matter model, which like ULA model or many other models. And 
This in principle is measurable. And one way to measure it in the ongoing set of experiments is to measure, they are not able to image it. So this image is for illustration. You're not able to see it. You'll not be able to see it for next 20, 25 years, actually. It's very difficult to detect it. But you can actually try to detect it statistically, just like we detect CMB, we detect it statistically. Uh, the power spectrum for most of these models actually is much larger than the power spectrum for lambda CDM models, so which is very good. It makes the detection also easier. So that it could be higher by a factor of five to 10, depending on what the model is. So this is a reasonable prediction of the model. But again, I would say a reasonable prediction because there are there's a fair amount of uncertainty uh, with respect to other observables. Uh, other uh, modeling parameters, like uh, how, how fast does realization go and various things. But it's a prediction. Spectral distortion as a probe uh, was like uh, something we looked at in great detail to try to see if we can actually get something about, about this. And it turns out it's not, it's not great. I mean, it, it is uh, not very encouraging. It's very interesting theoretical exercise to do. And we looked at a whole range of dark matter models and looked at how it will change the prediction of CMB spectral distortion. So CMB spectral distortion expected for the CDM model is around 10 power uh, minus nine, which is very small, but I'll come to what experiments are going to come actually in the next decade. And the difference for some cases could be like 10%, 15%, but many of these models are not preferred actually. So I will, I'm looking at like three to 4% difference between these models and many other class of models as a potential probe, it is going to be a challenge to do that. Right? But one thing which is encouraging is that the upcoming experiments will have the sensitivity to do it. Whether they can actually reach this level and get rid of all the systematic effects is going to be a challenge. But this would be addressed within the next 10 years. So this is another thing that I discussed very briefly that you can explain the result of edges by pumping energy in the pre-decombination era rather than later. And what happens, and this is a plot where uh, what I plotted on the y-axis is uh, the photon occupation number of a photon uh, of CMB and uh, eta zero is the background and eta is what you put in and x is the frequency in, in terms of h nu by kt. So you need to put in energy around x of 10 power minus three actually to explain the just result. And uh, you can put you can see the ratio here when you put in the energy is around a thousand four three four hundred and after a while only a small part of it is, remains to reach it a thousand large part of this energy gets pumped into the cmb and it causes global spectral distortion and this level of global spectral distortion could be pretty high i mean as as you want i mean the point is the current observational upper limit is 10 power minus five it could be 10 power minus a factor of three smaller than that so if edges result is correct and it's verified and this is a plausible explanation of the result that there was an energy injection in the pre-recombination era it leaves behind completely detectable signatures in cmb spectrum because the energy you'll have to put in to even achieve what you seek would be at least 100 times larger than what the, the final residue would be and that will leave detectable signatures on cmb spectrum so I think now I'll conclude. So the nature of dark matter is still unknown in spite of the success of Lambda CDM model. Experiments such as have failed so far. And there are also issues with the model at small scales. The many cosmological observables at small scales that constrain alternate dark matter and I talked about some of them, but not in great detail. Lyman alpha uh, will require a talk for itself actually to explain what Lyman alpha data and is how it is used. Collapse fraction of H1 at high redshift, for instance. But there is hope, Lyman alpha data is improving uh, as we speak. I mean, SDSS has great data, but we need it at small scales. H1 signal from the epoch of reionization, like edges result, for instance, and other ongoing probes like SKA, uh, which is again set to start working in the next decade or so, will have some bearing on this. And I didn't say a word about what dark edges. We, there are probes, I mean, being proposed right now. I mean, the people want to go on the other side of the moon to do this experiment to study dark ages of the universe. And this is going to reach it of 50. So that actually would be fairly definitive for the nature of dark matter. But again, again, I didn't say much about dark ages during my talk. CMB spectral distortion, my favorite, because it's a very linear probe. I mean, it's a totally linear probe. It could happen because of silly damping, which is like damping of perturbations that exist or global energy injection, 
uh, it's possible that there is a global energy injection. The hope here is that there is an upcoming telescope, Pixie, which might have a sensitivity of 10 power minus 10. So all of this is well within that. And I have no idea when the Pixie will fly, maybe another 10 years. Like, I mean, I've heard 2026, something that I've heard. But uh, if it does, then many of the issues I discussed, they may be well within the scope of these experiments, these, these kind of experiments. So I think I'll stop now. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Shiv, for uh, very nice coverage of all the signatures. Um, so now, uh, shall we take the questions from the audience? Uh, yes. Starting with uh, the Andy's talk. Sure, and please. I request uh, all of the participants, in case you have put something in the chat box and feel that it is important enough you would like to ask, then do raise your hand and I'll try to uh, give you the mic or uh, we will just try to decide between the speaker and myself uh, what questions we address and maybe ask you to uh, raise the question yourself. So let me begin with um, um, the first question was from Prabha, which said in inflation, non this is to Andy, in inflation, non-Gaussianity arises from interaction of the inflaton field. Would it be correct to relate it to quantum entanglement and consider non-Gaussianity as a measure of the entanglement? Well, well I'm glad that question came up because that's something I um, didn't, I decided not to include in my short talk, but absolutely um, non-Gaussianity is a real quantum effect. And I, I think you know, it's it's been well studied, and and um, I mean, I, I in re re really honestly, even I mean, given uh, the origin of fluctuations, even the Gaussianity is a quantum effect in, in these theories. So, so so the whole picture is is quantum, and certainly the emergence of non-Gaussianity is a very quantum effect, and and it doesn't, you know, these these various sort of categories I sketched of behaving classically, it's not one of those. It's, it's a quantum effect. So thank you. Yes. Okay. That's an important example. Great. Great. So uh, then there is question from uh, uh, Rajagopalan Nair. Do you want to be unmuted? No, I don't. I cannot slide, scroll down the list of all the participants to unmute him. How do I do that? Sir, if you raise sir, your I didn't hand. ask any questions. So I, I just I commented. That's all. Ah, go ahead. Oh, I see. Okay. So, would you like yes. to state your comment? What can be useful information? Oh, the, sorry. Yes, sir, 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 sir. All right. All right. Okay. Then, a um, uh, question from Sushmita is in the cartoon, two, pendu two pendulums are suspended. I think it's one pendulum. Am I right, Andy? Uh, yes. Yeah. It's two states of one pendulum. It's a coherent superposition of, right. of, of two classical states of one pendulum. Yes. So we come to Ashley Wilkins. Uh, can I, do, would you like to ask your question yourself? But somehow I'm not able to scroll down to... Can you, can you hear me? Oh, great. Yeah, go ahead, please. Thanks. Um, th thanks for your talk, Andy. First of all, I thought it was really interesting. Hi. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so you've mentioned how you have this sort of classical um, evolution followed by this sort of subsequent decoherence, and this essentially hides a lot of the quantum phenomena uh, of this vacuum. Um, does this sort of have any relation, or does it have any impact on, you know, like the Transplankian uh, censorship conjecture that people talk about, and like the idea that people worry about these modes above like the Planckian scale because we don't currently have a quantum theory of gravity. But then, do you think that these modes then might be? sort of the quantum nature of these modes might then be hidden in a similar sort of way. So therefore, it's not something to worry about. I, I, I find the, this whole Transplankian topic really intriguing uh, as ma much as anything as a probe of the sociology of our, <laughs> our, our um, community, because I think people come at it from really different ways. And there are people who are very protective of certain conventional QFT ideas about um, uh, about about you know protecting okay. low energies from from high energy behavior and what what kind of what kind of hierarchy, hierarchies people expect to have. I'm I'm less 
of that ilk. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I understand why you have to think that way in QFT, but I sort of feel that the, um, the sorts of questions that you, you package under great principles of uh, sort of keeping QFT a nice low energy theory are very different when you start doing cosmology and are trying to understand the state of the universe and how everything works. And so I'm very open to the idea that we have to be curious and register our concern that these, we may not know what we're talking about when we get into these transplanking modes. And I, and I'm not quite personally, I'm not quite ready to say, well, if we hide them away, I mean, how do they, what do they do? <laughs> if we don't understand what they do, how do we know we can hide them away? So, so that's my personal view, but I think that's something that there's a lot of different ideas. It's sort of a test of your prior as much as anything. How, how do you want to go about thinking of these things? So, so I just register my viewpoint as one of a variety of ways these things can go without, without I'm not convinced it's um, any deeper than, than other things people might say. Mm -hmm. So there's a question from Suddhasattva Brahma. Uh, uh, can we not use measures of entanglement and their imprints on primordial statistics to look for quantum origin? Say regarding properties of the bunch Davis state of inflation. Do we have any imprints of these? Well, statistics? well, I, 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 I mean, there's different things you could say about that. I've, I've done a lot of work proposing that maybe bunch Davies, maybe it's not quite bunch Davies. Maybe there's, there's a variety of, uh, of other phenomena that could start inflation with slightly different from bunch Davies, things that differ in a, a way um, that involves other sorts of entanglement. I, in terms of, and that might be observable and we're working, uh, working those things out. I, I think in some sense, so, so far, the way we've treated bunch, standard bunch Davies, uh, I mean, in some sense, the whole set of predictions is a, a reflection of what the bunch Davies state is. Um, and we have those predictions. So I guess it's, are there new phenomena that we haven't noticed yet? So I, I, think, I think we, you could say everything we predict from inflation is result of the properties of the bunch Davies state, but, and is therefore a prediction of quantum physics. But um, I guess, are there new phenomena yet to be uncovered? It's sort of a, the thing I was, it was a conversation I was trying to provoke by my talk. Okay. Okay, so then I think there are two last questions which men can probably be read together. One is from Swagat Mishra, who says, why do you uh, refer to initial vacuum state to be exotic? And there's another question that says, uh, from Vikash Chandra Paul, can you please explain again what is exotic quantum state? Yeah, so I, I threw that word around. <laughs> so, so, of course, someone tried to call me on it. <laughs> so, so um, I, I guess, you know, the, the quantum field theory vacuum is certainly a very different idea. It's not a, part of, it's not a particle, it's a homogeneous state. It's, um, it's not what you would think classically the vacuum would look like. So it's, it's a, maybe I should, uh, obviously it's not exotic if you've been using quantum field theory your whole life, but, but it's, um, it's its own thing. Maybe I'll just say that. It's not, it's not a wave packet, it's not a plane wave, it's its own thing and, and um, uh, you could, yeah. Uh, <laughs> whether you call, you can, I guess we, each one of us, each one of, uh, of the 122 participants can decide if we want to call it exotic or not. I don't think, I don't think, it, I mean, we all know what the quantum field theory vacuum is and I, and I don't think I can, um, I don't want to argue whether it's exotic or not, actually. I just threw that word. <laughs> word in there on my slides. All right. Does anyone... Sorry, I mean, it's, I mean, maybe, maybe yeah. I'll just say, it is pretty awesome to think that the thing that's the vacuum of quantum field theory describes every single object in the universe, you know, is the origin of every... So to me, that, it does feel like, okay, it does feel exotic. <laughs> it feels, wow, you take the vacuum of 
th th it's supposed to be nothing and you make the entire universe out of it. So I don't know. That's what I was trying to convey. So does someone else want to make any comment uh, primarily for Andy's part of the talk? I think you are able to unmute yourselves if you wish. And uh, no. So, so if not, we moved. Uh, so thanks a lot, Andy, also for responding very nicely. Hey, thank you. The questions. Yeah, these are these are great questions. This is a really fun meeting. I, I really look forward to the in-person <laughs> version where we can hang out and continue these discussions. Yes, fantastic. Thanks a lot, everyone. Sure. Um, Okay, so um, yeah, I, I guess um, you were to sleep when you want now. Uh, so now yeah, let oh, us. Thank you, thank you, thanks, yeah. thanks, Andy. Uh, so now we turn to the questions that were directed primarily to uh, Shiv, uh, starting what with. Uh, uh, let me just scan quickly. I think they are all quite important questions. And if any one of you wishes to speak yourself, uh, do unmute yourself, and then you can ask. But Deva Prasad Mahiti is asking if the fermions are in condensed state by some mechanics, does the bound on fermion dark mass of uh, point greater than 0.4 keV still hold, uh, dark matter mass? No, it won't, actually. Not in that case, right? Right. Because Once it's condensed state, it's not going yes, to be... It will happen, like the whole point is this is using Fermi statistics. Right. The fact that uh, uh, two particles cannot share a single state. This is a very simple calculation, actually. So Which then, is. there is a question from Rajiv about uh, pre-galactic black holes. Uh, oh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. whether that, that can hide some of the. I think that's what he means. No, no. Rajiv has basically said that some part of the mass range. Pdh range and asteroid DH, mass window could actually be allowed. Right. right. I said like. Uh, still open. So it is still. Oh, of course, it's open. Right. And uh, Junik Sen Gupta, what is the problem with hot uh, dark matter and uh, compared to CDM? Is the HDM case of temperature grows relativistic and causes some problem? No, no, no. I, I actually did say it during my talk that if it is a hot dark matter, then the structures do not form. Structures yeah. form at very but, large scales. But then this, uh, how do axions work? Because they are also extremely light. So how do they? Yeah, but axions are not. Okay, okay. So good question, actually. This is something I needed to say during my talk. <laughs> An axion is extremely light, but it is cold. So how come? Because axion is never coupled to the thermal bath of the universe. So ah. axion is like a scalar field in its ground state. That means these are particles of finite mass, very small but finite mass, but zero velocity. So, and because they are zero velocity, the coherent scale is the entire universe. And the other thing is that they are non-relativistic particles. The only way to achieve it is if they were never coupled to the thermal bath of the universe. So when I say something is hot, I meant coupled to the universe. In that case, it has to be massive. But if something is not coupled to the thermal bath of the universe, then they are decoupled from the Big Bang way back. Uh, absolutely. When, right. yeah. So absolutely. So all axions are very light. So one may, may ask, you, how can you have a light particle and be, because all, all along I was saying you need to be mass, it needs to be massive. So these are special conditions in which they were never coupled. So if they were ever coupled to the thermal bath, they will of course become relativistic. And that will be a problem. So axions are, axions so, should be seen as a scalar field in its ground state. Mm -hmm. Very large coherent scales and oh. non-relativistic particles because they are never coupled to the thermal bath of the universe. Right. That's, a, that's a proper way to look at them. So Bikash Chandra Paul has had a question about your CDM graph, but I think you addressed it. We don't have Z equal to zero contributions. Uh, I mean, right? Uh, which plot are we can can I go back to my plots actually because uh, so because you want to ask your question yeah please please go ahead hello yes we yes, can yeah go ahead or did he end up answering it during the talk CDM not seen which plot is this because like can I go back and you, you can tell me which uh, plot is you have three plot J equal to zero. You have J equal uh -huh. to hundred or something. Oh, sure. I'll go back right there. Yeah. Okay. So maybe your chat box has to be removed from yes. the of the screen. This plot? Uh, yes, this one. Huh. What was you it? You have baryon and massive nucleus, but CDM curve is not there. So Sorry? 
I want to know why it is is it uh, overlapped or I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Can can you speak a bit louder, please? Actually, CDM CDM card is not visible. Yeah, yeah because they are uh, CDM and barium are on top of each other actually. Oh yeah. There so barium and CDM are almost. That's it. Yes, so CDM and baryonic perturbations have caught up with each other, and they are on top of each other. That's the point, actually. So there are two plots there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So let me get to Brajesh Kanod. Uh, can you please mute yourself again, Vikash? Vikash, please mute yourself. Uh, Priyamvada is asking: Is there any model that gives different flavor or types for massive neutrinos as well? suppose you can build models like i mean yes there are plenty of models but can we i i thought i thought you could not uh, accommodate any more flavors right there is a well, limit of 3 or from can if this neutrino so okay you can have sterile neutrino sterile kind of neutrinos yeah okay to some extent, the, yeah. what happens in sterile kind of neutrinos is that they are so the the bound from cmb comes from energy density that is contributed by all the neutrinos so if we have a standard model neutrino you can only That's, have 2 degrees that is constrained definitely right but if it is a sterile neutrino which decoupled well before this neutrino decoupled then its temperature would be much lower if its temperature is much lower then it contributes much less energy density right to so you can have many of them okay. in principle so that will depend on when it decoupled from the thermal bath of the universe so the usual the standard model neutrino decouples around 1 mev that we know right around 1 mev it decouples but is something decoupled uh, very early in the universe and the point is there were many phases of uh, what you call like uh, not decay of something or like annihilation for instance electron proton annihilation is just one such phase so the relative temperature of the standard model neutrino and the sterile neutrino right would be different sterile neutrinos would be much colder so you can have cold neutrinos which are sterile because they don't contribute that much to the energy density in the universe so yes absolutely you can have and those models are studied the only thing is that you can't add a standard model neutrino into that thing you can add a colder neutrino absolutely so you can add many flavors so these models are studied many flavors but not neutrino in a standard model sense no that but is constrained so when we say constraint of 3.15 what i wrote that for only for standard model neutrino so only also always i have also assumed already that the the temperature of the neutrino is given by the physics around 1 mev right I've, that's implicitly assumed actually so let us take up two of the questions which actually refer to the presentation directly one is from sudipta das that says in the cross section versus energy curve mm -hmm. what are the gray shaded regions and why are are they are the dim uh, wimp like signals yes they are i'll just go back to that plot this one you are talking about deshaded regions right yeah is that is that the one these are shaded regions right right right, right. yes sir means, yes, you mean jagged yes, regions these are jagged regions right yes yeah so they are they are wimp yeah, absolutely okay. these are models which are still allowed actually these are allowed models from various theories yes all right and there's a question again from prabha uh, which says uh, there was probably uh, there is a slide on how different dark matter models affect the topology yes visually of the brightness temperature have you quantified the differences using topology and not just power spectrum no no we haven't actually no we haven't done that we can discuss it probably we can discuss it at some stage no i haven't done all that. right i know you are working you work on those things. i mean let's discuss sometime yeah great so then let us take up a few of the more uh, sort of Wait, there is one question from Jerome Mahta. Uh, would you like to ask your question, Jerome? If we believe in MWI, when did the splitting corresponding uh, to the measurement of perturbations occur during inflation in <laughs> and 1992? So this is uh, Shiv, can you see the question in the chat box? Uh, no, uh, this it, is. Uh, it's a bit down. Okay. Further down. Yeah. Uh, uh, what is the question? Can you say it again? Yeah. So, if we believe in MWI, uh, what is MWI? What, what does that mean? Some interactions. Uh, Milivik. Milivik. Uh, Milivik. Hello. Yeah. Hi. 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 Go ahead. 
This one, I, I'm sorry, my question is for Andy. Yeah, it's for Andy, actually, yeah. Oh, MWI okay. means many word interpretation. Ah, I see, I see. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, maybe it happened during impression, maybe in 1992. When they wrote the paper, it collapsed the wave function. Okay, no problem. Yeah, just, okay. yeah. But I think audience probably appreciates the question. And you had one more question. I think coherent state is not exotic. Okay. So that those are responses to Andy. I think people interested can read them and maybe discuss them with Jerome separately. Um, coming back to here, I think essentially there were then questions about other kinds of content and their meaning and their interactions. Uh, for example, in the cross section, no, that was done. Mm -hmm. But uh, what could be the possible nature of interaction between massive neutrinos and dark matter, if any? Let me read one more. If DM interacts with gravity as well, which of course it has to. Yeah, it has to. Uh, or well compared to in, uh, baryon interaction, does, the, does it interact with gravitational waves also? Yeah. Of course it does, right? But yes. go, go ahead, you want to answer, respond? No, I, I suppose all of these, for instance, neutrino dark matter interaction, we, in fact, some, one of the models like I worked on that actually. So mm -hmm. neutrino can... Uh, through a phase transition actually so the neutrino and dark matter can be coupled mm. in in some way so you can actually couple whichever component to whichever component uh, depending on what your theory is no but similarly there's a question about interaction uh, up further up from Brijesh Kanodia on uh, interaction of dark matter and baryons mm -hmm. so are, are, have these kind of interactions been considered and uh, do they have any impact on how the dark matter is distributed? So, and... so, so many of the plots I showed, I can actually show you some of the plots again. So almost all these models, so for instance, there is this model called CHDM. This is like a charge decay. So there here clearly there is strong coupling between baryons and dark matter, right? Because there is a charge particle that decays into a neutral particle and some other like light neutral particle. So clearly, like, I mean, there is a coupling and uh, CCDM, like the charge, uh, the mini charge dark matter is a clear interaction between dark matter and baryons and the other, like making an atom that again is also an interaction between baryons and dark matter. So yeah, absolutely. You need to introduce an interaction between some component and baryon and dark matter is the most natural interaction one is going to introduce if one has to deal with some of these issues. So almost most of the models has, except for you, uh, ULA model or for LFDM, which is late forming dark matter, all the other models do invoke some interaction between baryons and dark matter. Absolutely. They do. I mean, great. Urjit, maybe one last question and then we wind okay. up the session. All right. So I think I'll take this question from Sharvari, which says, What would be the observational signature of millicharged dark matter interacting with large scale magnetic fields? Uh, at galactic cluster scales, and can this be used to place any constraints? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the whole point is that many of these models, like milli charge particle or something that I studied, so of course, in the if there is magnetic field, they are going to actually interact with the magnetic field. The only thing is that the milli charge particle, so it will constrain from interaction with magnetic field, primarily the charge of the particle. So we require from cosmological from cosmological theory, for instance, I showed a plot of uh, uh, constrain, constraining this model from Planck data, for instance, this one, right? So clearly I did not show what the charge of the particle was. It's like one part in 10 per six, so it is small. So this charge is extremely tiny, actually. It's not a very large charge you require uh, to, for instance, even explain edges result. So yes, it will have an impact on magnetic field. Even in primordial case, it might have an effect. But I cannot answer the question what exact uh, impact it will have because magnetic field physics itself in our own galaxy is pretty complicated, right? But one thing that I looked at in some detail was how do you form the halo? So whether you can form the halo actually and uh, whether the halo will remain stable because if dark matter particles can cool just like baryons, they will fall into the disk and they'll destroy the halo and so clearly violate a very fundamental observation of a galaxy. That doesn't happen for any of these cases. So yes, it's possible. That needs to be studied. Okay, great. So I think um, we are going to uh, encroach on the next session, which we should not do. So let us thank both the speakers, Andy and Shiv, for uh, giving us excellent uh, insights into the topics they spoke on. And of course, very nice participation from audience. And um, 
Um, so Sriram, how much break are we giving the audience? Yeah, we meet in we meet in five minutes. We meet in five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Orji. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Shiv. Thank you, Andy.